My name is Thomas Haley, and for the last 10 years of my life, I considered myself a fairly happy man. I had a beloved wife, Kate, whom I met back in college and with whom we went through a lot together. Our marriage was not perfect. Like all couples, we had arguments and misunderstandings, got tired of the routine, and lacked attention for each other at times. But overall, we managed quite well. I tried to be a good husband, father to our two children, Michael and Sarah, and a reliable support for my family. My mother-in-law, Ellen, had always been an important part of our life. She and Kate were very close, and Ellen often came to stay with us, helped with the kids, and gave wise advice. She and I got along great, too. Ellen was witty, easy to talk to, and charming in her own way. Sometimes I caught myself thinking that she and I had a lot in common. We both loved books, old movies, and long conversations about everything under the sun. Kate even jokingly called us the conspirators. But even with all my fondness for Ellen, I never thought of her as anything other than a family member, until recently. It all started with a phone call one spring morning. Ellen called me and said she wanted to surprise Kate for her birthday, to give her something special as a symbol of closeness between her and her daughter. She asked for my help in choosing the gift. Thomas, you know Kate better than anyone else, and you'll be able to find a truly worthwhile present. And I so want to make her happy. Will you go shopping with me this weekend? Ellen said in a pleading voice. I didn't even hesitate. Of course, I was ready to help. We agreed to meet at the mall on Saturday morning and have a shopping marathon. On the appointed day, I arrived at the mall in high spirits. The chance to do something nice for Kate and spend time with Ellen seemed like a great idea. My mother-in-law was already waiting for me at the entrance. She looked wonderful in a light blue dress and wide-brimmed hat. The sun gilded her still beautiful face, and her eyes twinkled mischievously. Well, are you ready for our mission? She asked cheerfully, taking my arm. I smiled back, feeling a slight excitement, as if before some adventure. If only I knew what this gift shopping trip would turn into for me. We must have gone through a dozen stores, clothing, shoes, perfume, souvenirs, but we couldn't find anything suitable. Ellen, usually decisive and collected, seemed unusually distracted. She often became lost in thought, fell silent in mid-sentence, and gave me strange, studying looks. And she seemed to accidentally touch my hand, now straightening my shirt collar, now smoothing out the folds on my sleeve. I didn't make much of it. Maybe it was her maternal instinct. Although I can't say that I found these touches unpleasant. At some point, tired of walking through stores, we decided to take a break and have some coffee. Sitting at a table in a cozy cafe, we started talking about Kate, our families, the vicissitudes of family life. And then Ellen suddenly said a phrase that sent shivers down my spine. You know, Thomas, Sometimes it seems to me that there should be something more to life than the usual cycle of everyday routine. Some special spark, passion that makes you feel truly alive. Do you know what I mean? She looked me straight in the eye, and her gaze suddenly made me feel hot. At that moment, I distinctly realized that Ellen was not just my mother-in-law, but also an incredibly attractive, desirable woman, a woman with whom we definitely had some special connection. I hastily looked away, trying to drive away unbidden thoughts, and mumbled something about appreciating what you have. The conversation moved on to other topics, but for a long time I could not get rid of the strange feeling between vague excitement, shame, and curiosity. After our conversation in the cafe, the atmosphere between me and Ellen subtly changed. Stolen glances, accidental touches, ambiguous phrases, all this seemed to weave into some new pattern of our relationship. I tried to drive away thoughts about what was happening, blaming it on fatigue and imagination playing tricks on me. But at the same time, curiosity and some kind of irrational attraction to Ellen grew in me. I wanted to get to know her better, to see in her not only a mother-in-law and the mother of my wife, but a woman with her own desires and secrets. We continued our search for a gift, but now our dialogues kept slipping into some new, unusual direction. Thomas. Have you ever thought what it's like to lose your head from passion? To forget about everything in the world in the arms of another person? Ellen suddenly asked when we were looking at a display case with expensive perfume. I almost dropped the bottle in surprise. Um, I guess when Kate and I first started dating, we had something like that. But then, you know, everyday life, children, work, it all inevitably changes relationships. 
I replied, trying not to meet Ellen's gaze. That's a pity. I think passion is like oxygen. Without it, life is not life, but just existence, she said thoughtfully. I remained silent, not knowing what to say, but to myself, I thought that perhaps Ellen was right. A couple of hours later, after another fruitless search, we decided to take another break, this time in a small park near the mall. Sitting down on a bench under a spreading oak tree, we silently watched the few passers-by and children playing nearby. Ellen was the first to break the silence. Thomas, can I ask you a personal question? I tensed up but nodded. Are you happy? I mean, really, 100% happy in your life and your marriage to Kate? The question caught me off guard. I thought about it. Of course, I loved Kate, and we had a good family. But if I was being honest with myself, yes, I was missing something. Some sharpness, novelty, breathtaking emotions as if I was drifting along with the current instead of controlling my own life. I... I don't know, Ellen. Probably not 100%, I said slowly. And you? Are you happy in your marriage? Ellen smiled sadly. I love Wallace, but for many years now I've felt like I'm living only halfway, as if I'm looking at the world through a thick glass, and I can't really touch it, feel the taste and smell of life. And you know, Thomas, it seems that now... Next to you, this glass is starting to melt. With those words, she put her hand over mine. Gently, barely perceptibly, but it was as if an electric shock went through me. All thoughts instantly flew out of my head, leaving only an aching feeling that I was standing on the edge of an abyss and was about to take a step forward. Ellen felt it too. Her breathing quickened, her pupils dilated. She stared at my lips and I, obeying some irrational impulse, began to lean toward her. Our faces were already very close. I could feel her hot breath on my skin. And at that moment, my phone rang in my pocket. We pulled away from each other as if we'd been caught doing something obscene. And in fact, that's what it was. I pulled out my phone with trembling hands. It was Kate calling. Hi, honey. Well, how did the shopping go? Did you find anything interesting? My wife asked cheerfully. At the sound of her voice, a sense of reality instantly returned to me. God, what am I doing? What am I even thinking about? Kate is my wife, the mother of my children. I love her, and I can't betray her. Hi, sweetheart. I tried to make my voice sound natural. Yeah, nothing special so far, but we'll keep looking. I'll be home soon. After finishing the conversation, I turned to Ellen. She was sitting with her back turned, nervously fiddling with her purse. I cleared my throat. Ellen, listen. What just happened? Or rather, what almost happened? It can't happen again. We can't. I can't do this to Kate. I'm sorry. Ellen turned around sharply. There were tears in her eyes, but her gaze was determined. Don't apologize, Thomas. It's not your fault. It's me. I guess I just got confused and took our communication for something more. You're a good man, and you're doing the right thing by thinking about Kate. We'd better keep everything as it is. Let's stay friends and family, okay? I nodded feeling a strange mixture of relief and disappointment, and gratitude to Ellen for finding the strength to say what I didn't have the courage to say. We hugged goodbye, in a friendly, almost familial way. But it still seemed to me that her embrace lasted a little longer than it should have, and that her hands were trembling slightly as she stroked my back. That day, we never did buy a gift for Kate, but without wanting to, we gave rise to something bigger and more unpredictable. At that time, I still didn't understand that this meeting would be the first step on a path leading into the unknown, the first note in a melody of forbidden attraction and sweet guilt. There were still many surprises ahead of us. Over the next few weeks, I tried to put all thoughts of that day and the strange attraction that had arisen between me and Ellen out of my mind. I immersed myself in work, in everyday family affairs, trying to convince myself that nothing special had happened. Just a little misunderstanding caused by fatigue and unfamiliar surroundings. After all, Ellen and I had agreed to remain friends and relatives, right? So there was no need to torment myself and look for some hidden meaning in what happened. The only problem was that forgetting that aching feeling of closeness and the exciting tingling in my fingertips at the thought of touching Ellen turned out to be not so easy. In moments when I allowed myself to relax, behind the wheel of a car, in the shower, or on the verge of sleep, her image would pop up in my memory, robbing me of peace with her enigmatic half-smile and burning gaze of green eyes. 
my imagination painted completely indecent scenes, and I shamefully drove them away, trying to focus on work, on household chores, on conversations with Kate. Kate, my beloved wife, faithful companion of my life, who did not deserve her husband fantasizing about intimacy with another woman, and even with her own mother. In moments when the guilt became quite unbearable, I made double efforts to be the perfect husband and father. I showered Kate with signs of attention, arranged romantic surprises, spent a long time playing with the children, trying somehow to atone for my involuntary sin. Kate definitely noticed the changes in my mood. One evening, when we were lying in bed after a long and passionate lovemaking session, she turned to me and said thoughtfully, You know, honey, lately you've been acting strange, sometimes unusually attentive and gentle, other times as if your head is in the clouds. Of course, I'm not complaining, but... Is everything okay with you? Did something happen at work, maybe? I pulled her to me and buried my nose in her hair, inhaling the familiar, soothing scent. Everything's fine, love. I just have a lot on my plate. That's why I get lost in thought sometimes. But you and the kids are the most important thing I have. I love you all so much. Kate sighed happily and hugged me tighter, and my heart was torn apart with love for her and the gnawing guilt for what I didn't dare to admit even to myself. Soon, as always happens in moments of mental anguish, the day came that changed everything. It was a weekend, and our whole family gathered for a barbecue to celebrate Wallace's birthday, Ellen's husband. Ellen and Wallace lived in another city, and we saw them quite rarely. The last time was on that very fateful day of ill-fated shopping, so the prospect of a new meeting both excited and frightened me. When I saw Ellen, I was confused at first. She was wearing a light cream-colored dress that favorably set off her golden tan, and her honey-colored curls were gathered in a high hairstyle, exposing her shapely neck. Ellen greeted me with a friendly smile, but there was something in her gaze that made my heart race and my palms sweat. However, she immediately turned away and began to chat cheerfully about something with Kate and the other guests. All evening I carefully avoided Ellen, afraid to give myself away with a careless look or word. I joked a lot, played with the kids, discussed soccer matches with Wallace and the neighbors. In short, I did my best to appear carefree, but every now and then I would catch an attentive studying look from a pair of green eyes, and each time it pierced me through with sweet languor and excruciating desire. When it got dark, the guests dispersed around the house and garden. Kate was chatting with her friends on the veranda, Wallace was showing his beer mug collection to his buddies, the kids were enthusiastically playing video games. I was sitting in the living room pretending to read the newspaper, but mentally coming up with an excuse to slip away unnoticed by everyone, and especially by Ellen. Suddenly I heard her soft voice, Thomas, would you help me find something in the attic? Wallace says they have an old telescope lying around somewhere, I want to show it to the kids. Startled, I nearly jumped in place. Ellen was standing right in front of me, her head slightly tilted to the side and looking at me expectantly. In the subdued light of the floor lamp, her skin looked velvety and the shadow of her eyelashes fell on her cheekbones, giving her face an almost predatory expression. Uh, well of course, let's find it now, I mumbled, feverishly thinking what to do. Refuse and look like a rude person? or go into the lioness's den, knowing that my principles might waver. Ellen smiled slyly, as if reading my mind, and headed for the stairs to the second floor. Her shapely figure swayed seductively with each step, making me involuntarily admire the perfect lines of her hips and buttocks under the thin fabric of her dress. Swallowing, I followed, feeling the blood pounding in my temples. The attic greeted us with silence and the pungent smell of old things, dust, and for some reason roses. Ellen turned on a small lamp and in its flickering light began to rummage through drawers and boxes. So, telescope, telescope, where did Wallace put it? I have no idea, she muttered discontentedly, delving deeper into the piles of junk. I stood behind her, trying to look anywhere but at Ellen, and especially not at her temptingly protruding butt when she bent over. Suddenly, Ellen straightened up and turned to me. She was standing so close that I could see the fluttering shadows of her eyelashes and the tiny golden flecks in her green iris. Thomas, she suddenly said very seriously, I have to tell you something. What happened between us then? Or almost happened? I can't forget it. 
and I see that you can't either. Her words took my breath away and my heart began to pound wildly. Ellen, please don't. We agreed. I can't. I love Kate, I pleaded, feeling the ground slipping from under my feet. But she only shook her head, not taking her burning gaze off me. You love Kate, but you want me. I can see the way you look at me, how you catch my every move. We're the same, Thomas. We both lack sharpness, brightness in life. We're made for each other. With those words, she stepped forward and pressed herself against me with her whole body. I gasped, stunned by the heat of her touch even through clothes. And the next moment, her lips greedily pressed into mine, making me forget about everything in the world. Ellen's kiss was scorching and intoxicating, making me lose myself in a whirlwind of conflicting emotions. On the one hand, my mind desperately insisted that it was wrong, immoral, that I was betraying Kate and destroying our family. But on the other hand, my body and heart literally sang with delight from the incomparable feeling of flying, lightness, absolute harmony. As if all my life I had been a puzzle with a missing piece. And now I finally found the missing part, falling into place in the mosaic of being. When we broke apart, breathing hard, Ellen's eyes danced with mischievous sparks. Well, do you believe me now? She purred, wrapping her arms around my neck. With one hand, she deftly unbuttoned my shirt and began tracing patterns on my chest, teasing and inflaming me. Ellen, my God, what are we doing? This is crazy, I moaned, feeling the last of my self-control melting away like ice cubes under the scorching sun of her touch. Crazy is living by someone else's rules, denying your true desires, she whispered, trailing kisses along my chin. I want you, Thomas. I've wanted you for a long time, and I know you want me too. Listen to yourself. And I listened. At that moment, all the arguments of reason simply evaporated, leaving only an all-consuming passion. Groaning, I picked Helen up in my arms and plunged into her lips with a demanding, passionate kiss. She gasped and wrapped her legs around my waist, pressing her whole body against me. We sank down on the old couch that Wallace used as a storage for unnecessary junk. Dust particles danced in the ray of the setting sun breaking through the attic window. Clothes flew to the sides, and I was once again struck by the perfection of Helen's naked body. Smooth, radiant, as if glowing from within. She was as if created for love. Every curve, every line of her figure literally begged for a caress. I didn't keep her waiting. We merged in tender embraces, enjoying each other's closeness and warmth. My hands gently stroked her trembling body, giving pleasure and care. I covered her face and neck with kisses, whispering words of love, our breathing quickened, our hearts beating in unison. Oh, Thomas, how good it is with you. I'm so happy, Helen whispered, squeezing me in her arms. My heart overflowed with tenderness and the desire to make her the happiest in the world. What happened next? I remember in snatches, as if through a fog. A furious ride, merged moans, greedy kisses, hands kneading and scratching heated flesh. It seems that at some point the old sofa could not withstand our lovemaking and collapsed, but we didn't care anymore. We rolled on the dusty floor, completely losing track of time, forgetting about everything in the world, reveling in each other. When it was over, and we lay side by side, panting, coming to our senses, reality hit me like an icy wave. Oh, Lord, what have I done? How could I? Betrayed everything that was dear to me, my love, my family, my honor. Shame and disgust with myself flooded me. How will I now look Kate in the eye? What will I say to Wallace and the children if the truth comes out? Helen must have sensed my state. She propped herself up on one elbow and looked into my face. Her cheeks were flushed and her eyes glittered with the reflection of recent pleasure. Thomas, darling, don't torture yourself. What just happened? It was predestined, predestined by fate itself. It couldn't be otherwise, she said softly. No, Helen, this is a terrible mistake. We shouldn't have, we have families, children. How will I look Kate in the eye? I groaned, covering my face with my hands. Helen sighed and gently pulled my palms away. She caught my gaze with her mesmerizing green eyes, in the depths of which golden sparks danced. Thomas, listen to me carefully. Yes, we have families, and we are not going to destroy them. What happens between us is our little secret, our magical world where we can be ourselves. We won't hurt anyone if we're careful. We'll just enjoy each other, 
and the feelings we give each other. And as for the rest, nothing will change. Do you understand me? I looked at her at my Helen, beautiful, vicious, wise, and reckless, the one who stirred up my life, turned all my ideas about love and passion upside down, the one without whom my existence would never be the same again. And I knew that despite the guilt, the fear, and the shame, I would not be able to give her up. Not now, when I had tasted the forbidden fruit. Not now, when my heart beats only for her. Yes, Helen, yes, I understand, I answered quietly and pulled her to me, feeling her heart beating in unison with mine. At that moment, I ceased to be the old Thomas, and I acquired a new identity, the existence of which I had not even suspected. The identity of a passionate lover, a secret sinner, blinded by forbidden love. And this new identity has since become a part of me, my second self. The next few weeks merged into one continuous kaleidoscope of secret meetings, furtive glances, feverish embraces, and endless lies. Helen and I used every opportunity to see each other in private. We made up all sorts of reasons and excuses, invented complex schemes and even secret signs to communicate with each other. It was a double life in the literal sense of the word. During the day, I was an exemplary family man, a loving husband, a caring father, a successful worker. I diligently played my role, only occasionally allowing myself fleeting fantasies and memories of our frenzies with Helen. And in the evenings, when Kate and the children fell asleep, I would sneak to the computer and spend hours corresponding with Helen, aching with the desire to touch her, to feel the heat of her body. We exchanged photos, bold, stirring the imagination, balancing on the brink of decency. We made secret dates, each time choosing new places, out-of-town motels, secluded corners of parks, rental apartments. And there, away from prying eyes, we gave free rein to our unbridled passion. We made love as if each time could be our last. Helen was insatiable, and next to her I myself turned into a wild beast that knew no barriers. Time after time we brought each other to the heights of bliss, stifling moans with kisses, digging into each other in sweet agony. Then, lying in each other's arms and catching our breath, we talked about everything in the world. I got to know Helen from new angles, admired the liveliness of her mind, the depth of her judgments, her amazing erudition. With her, one could talk for hours about books and art, about the meaning of life and the nature of love. Often our philosophical conversations smoothly flowed into a new round of crazy passion. Helen seemed to know my body better than I knew myself unerringly guessing all the erogenous zones, masterfully playing on the strings of my desires. But sooner or later, the fairy tale would come to an end, and we had to return to the real world. To family dinners, everyday conversations, familiar responsibilities. Every time I kissed Kate goodbye or read a bedtime story to the children, I felt my heart torn apart by contradictions. I loved my family, but I also could not simply physically could not give up Helen. Helen became for me both a lifeline and a destructive whirlpool, a breath of fresh air, and a sweet poison that corroded my soul. Someone without whom life lost all its colors, and someone because of whom I could lose everything I had. But even realizing this, even feeling how my former cozy and understandable reality was bursting at the seams, I could not stop. Strangely, the more fiercely the fire between me and Helen burned, the more indifferent I became to everything else. Home, work, friends. Everything faded into the background, paling in comparison with the extravaganza of feelings that we experienced with her. I lost weight, became haggard, became distracted and nervous. Kate, of course, noticed these changes. At first, she attributed it to a busy schedule and everyday problems, but soon her questions and worried looks became more and more insistent. Thomas, what's the matter with you? You haven't been yourself lately. You're always floating somewhere, coming back after midnight, hiding your phone and mail from me. Do you have someone else? She asked me one evening in desperation, unable to stand it any longer. Hearing those words, I froze. Had she guessed everything? How? From where? Trying to keep a calm face, I put my arm around her shoulders and said in a faltering voice, God, Kate, of course not. How could you think that? There's just a lot of things piling up. I'm very tired. I'm sorry for making you worry. I promise I'll do better. Kate looked at me incredulously, but nodded, nestling against my chest. 
and I stood there stroking her hair and feeling my heart torn apart by the monstrous burden of guilt and lies. At that moment, I hated myself more than I had ever hated myself before, and I realized that this could not go on. The next day I met with Helen at our usual place, a small hotel on the outskirts of town. Helen looked stunning as always, hair tousled, green eyes shining with anticipation, lips curved in an inviting half-smile. Seeing me, she slid into my arms with a smooth feline movement and began to cover my face with kisses. But today, even her touch could not drive away the gloomy thoughts that tormented me. Gently pushing Helen away, I sat her down on the edge of the bed and taking a deep breath said, Helen, we need to talk. Seriously, I can't live like this anymore. This double life, the constant deception, the fear of exposure, it's all killing me. I can't do this anymore. Helen frowned and looked into my eyes intently. What do you mean, Thomas? Are you, are you going to break up with me? Leave me? She asked quietly. Her words made my heart clench. How could I explain to her that it wasn't about my feelings for her? They were as strong as ever? But that I just couldn't bear the guilt anymore. This fear of losing my family and ruining the lives of my loved ones? No, Helen, of course I'm not going to leave you. My God, I love you, can't you see? I cried out in desperation, dropping to my knees in front of her and squeezing her hands. But understand me, too. I'm married. I have two children. I can't just throw it all away. I can't hurt them like that. And you, you're married, too. You have your own family. Think what will happen if Wallace finds out. Or God forbid, Kate, it's a real nightmare. Helen looked at me, and there were tears glistening in her eyes. I never thought I would see the unbending, self-confident Helen so vulnerable and sad. That's probably how they see a beautiful swan at the moment when a hunter's arrow pierces its chest. Thomas, my love, do you think I don't understand that it's easy for me? She whispered, freeing her hands and hugging herself by the shoulders, as if trying to shield herself from my words. Every day I struggle with myself, remind myself that it won't work out for us, that one day it will all end. But as soon as I see you, touch you, all this ceases to matter. I love you, Thomas. In a way, I've never loved anyone before, and for the sake of this love, I'm ready for anything. My heart was bursting with pity for her, with boundless tenderness and the realization of the inevitability of our parting. How easy it would have been to succumb to temptation, to send the arguments of reason to hell and plunge back into the whirlpool of wild passion. But no, today, for some reason, today common sense finally prevailed. Helen, please, let's just end it all before it's too late. Let's keep in our memory the beautiful things that were between us, but not destroy the lives of our loved ones. We, we must stay away from each other for the sake of our families, for our own sake. I spoke softly but firmly, realizing that if I showed weakness, I would not find the strength to end it all tomorrow. Helen was silent for a long time, staring at one spot. There were tears in her eyes, but she did not let them fall. Then she slowly nodded and said quietly, You're right, Thomas. It will be better for everyone this way. Just know that I will never regret what was between us. You will always remain in my heart, my greatest love, my unfulfilled dream. She got up and began to dress in silence. I wanted to hug her, to comfort her, to tell her that I myself was shattered, crushed by our decision. But I restrained myself. As she approached the very door, Helen looked into my eyes one last time and whispered, Goodbye, Thomas. Be happy. And she walked out of the room, carefully closing the door behind her. And I collapsed on the bed, giving vent to the tears that were choking me. I wept, sobbing, shaking all over, pouring out the pain of loss, the fear of the future, the bitterness of parting with the woman who had become my whole universe. I don't know how long I lay there like that. At some point, the tears dried up, leaving behind a ringing emptiness and a strange numbness. I got up, mechanically dressed, and left the hotel. I got in the car and drove home. Where else? At home, everything was the same as always. The children pounced on me with hugs and joyful shouts. Kate kissed me on the cheek and called me to dinner. I smiled, nodded, mechanically answered questions but inside me it was as if a black hole had formed, swallowing all emotions. 
Lying awake at night next to the snoring Kate, I pondered the vicissitudes of fate, about how unexpected turns change our whole life, about how sometimes you have to sacrifice the most precious things for the sake of duty and honor. Deep down, I hoped that I had done the right thing, that the pain of loss would dull over time and be replaced by a sense of relief that I had managed to keep my family together, that one day I would be able to remember Helen with gratitude and slight sadness, but without longing and regret. In the meantime, I had to go on living, to be strong, for Kate, for the children, for myself, to put my life back together piece by piece, to learn to value what I have, and to pray that the nightmare of what happened would never be repeated, because I might not be able to bear it a second time. The following weeks turned into one endless Groundhog Day for me. I got up to the alarm clock, had breakfast with my family, kissed Kate, took the kids to school. I spent hours at work, mechanically solving work issues, smiling at colleagues, trying hard to pretend that everything was fine. And all the while I was thinking about Helen. Her last words were burning in my head like a neon sign. Goodbye, Thomas. Be happy. What happiness is there when my heart is shattered to smithereens, and each new day is like a colorless copy of the previous one? I guess that's how addicts feel in rehab, when the withdrawal twists the body, wrenching the joints, depriving of the last strength, when the only desire is to get a new pleasure at any cost, to feel the blissful oblivion again. Only my pleasure was Helen, her smell, her voice, the silk of her skin under my fingers, everything that I myself had given up. Kate, of course, noticed the changes in my mood. At first, she was glad that I wasn't staying out late anymore, that I wasn't carrying my phone and laptop around with me everywhere. But over time, my detachment and coldness began to cause her anxiety. Thomas, what's going on with you? She asked one evening when we were alone, unable to stand it. You're like you've lost your light. You walk around gloomier than a cloud. I'm afraid to even talk to you. Maybe you're sick. You should go to the doctor, get some tests done. Her concern made me feel even worse. God, if only it were that simple. If only my heartache could be cured by a visit to the therapist or a course of pills. But no, my illness was of a different kind. And only I could cope with it myself. Everything's fine, honey, really, I squeezed out, trying to muster some semblance of a smile. I'm just very tired. There's an emergency at work. I promise everything will work out soon. Hugging Kate, inhaling the scent of her hair, I suddenly realized with all clarity that I had to change something. I couldn't go on living in a world of illusions, indulging in dreams of the unattainable. I had a family, and it was to them that I had to dedicate myself entirely, without reserve. To get Helen out of my head no matter how hard it was, to start everything from scratch. And I began to try. I doubled my attention to my wife and children, began to arrange family outings in nature, resumed the long-forgotten tradition of joint dinners. Kate blossomed before our eyes, seeing that our family life was gradually getting better. The children were also happy to spend more time with their father. Gradually, the pain began to subside, replaced by a dull, aching longing. I still thought about Helen, but no longer with the same intensity. I learned to remember our meetings with a slight sadness, and not with a desperate desire to get everything back. After all, I had memories left, and that's more than many people have. Almost a year passed like this. My life entered its usual rut. I learned to enjoy simple family joys again. Helen disappeared from our horizon. Apparently, she also deemed it best to stop all communication. Only occasionally did I get some snippets of information about her from Kate, but I tried to ignore them. And then one day, on one of those cozy autumn evenings, when Kate and I were sitting in the kitchen over a cup of tea, the phone rang. Kate picked up the phone, listened for a while, and then suddenly turned pale and said in a faltering voice, What? My God, it can't be. Yes, yes, of course. We'll be right there. Hold on. She slowly put down the phone and turned to me. There were tears in her eyes, her lips trembling. Thomas, it's Mom. She had a stroke. She's in the hospital in serious condition. We need to go. I felt as if I had been doused with ice water. Helen, a stroke? This simply can't be. Not her, so energetic, so full of life. Grabbing the crying Kate in an armful, I began to frantically calm her down, although I myself could barely stand on my feet from the news that had fallen on me. 
The next few hours flew by as if in a fog, frantic preparations, a long drive to the clinic, a bewildered Wallace sitting in the corridor near the intensive care unit, doctors uttering incomprehensible terms from which Kate only wept more. And then, endless waiting, hours and days at Helen's bedside, still unconscious, entangled in wires and tubes. Kate's muffled sobs, Wallace's muttering, my own soul-wrenching plea. God, please, just don't take her away. I've realized everything. I won't repeat my mistake again. And the memories, memories endlessly scrolling through my head. Our first meeting, her sparkling eyes and infectious laughter. The cautious flirtation that grew into an all-consuming passion. Secret meetings, feverish whispers, the heat of bodies merging into one, and that fateful day when I decided to end it all, not realizing that I was cutting out a piece of my own heart. Now, looking at Helen's pale, haggard face, I suddenly realized with piercing clarity how wrong I had been. How foolish it was to think that I could just take and erase her from my life, from my very essence. She had become a part of me, the best part, and losing her would mean losing myself. I sat at her bedside for hours, holding her lifeless hand, whispering words of love and repentance, begging her to come back to me, promising mountains of gold, and it seemed that sometimes her eyelids trembled slightly, as if she could hear me through the veil of unconsciousness. Days turned into weeks, and the doctor's prognosis remained guarded. Helen's condition stabilized, but she still did not regain consciousness. Kate and Wallace took turns on duty at her bedside, and I came as often as I could, inventing all sorts of excuses for my absence. And every time, looking at her exhausted face, I felt a monstrous guilt corroding me from the inside. It was as if it was not a stroke that had put Helen on this hospital bed, but my cowardice and indecision. As if by renouncing our love, I had doomed her to a slow fading. I couldn't share these thoughts with anyone. I bore this burden alone, and only at night, in restless dreams, I saw Helen again, Young, beautiful, laughing, calling me to her, beckoning with an inviting gesture, and I rushed to her, stumbling and falling, but she kept moving away, dissolving in the pre-dawn haze. Waking up in cold sweat, I frantically groped for Kate sleeping next to me, as if trying to make sure that this was not another vision, and burying my face in her hair, I choked with silent sobs, realizing every time more clearly that I could no longer live like this that I had to make a choice once and for all, and my choice was made on the day when Helen finally opened her eyes. I was on duty at her bedside when I noticed her fingers twitch slightly. Jumping up, I leaned over her, hardly daring to breathe, and then her eyelids trembled, and she looked at me, directly, consciously, as before. Thomas, she whispered, her voice hoarse from long silence. You're here? Tears gushed from my eyes. I rushed to her, gently taking her face in my palms, showering her with kisses. Helen, my love, of course I'm here. Where else could I be? I almost lost you. I thought I would go crazy. She smiled weakly and raised a trembling hand, gently touching my cheek. Silly, I would never leave you. Not like this. I caught her palm, pressed it to my lips, feeling how happiness and relief are filling me to the brim. Nothing else mattered at this moment. Not the upcoming difficult conversation with Kate, not the condemnation of society, not the fear of the unknown. I knew with certainty that I would never let Helen go again, that our love was stronger than any obstacles and prejudices. Of course, it was not easy. Kate took my decision hard. There were tears, reproaches, threats. Wallace was beside himself with rage, promising me all the torments of hell. The children were lost and confused, not understanding what was happening to their parents. But Helen and I were together, and this gave us strength to withstand any storms. Step by step, day by day, we rebuilt our lives, not perfect, full of difficulties and bumps on the road. We learned to be not just passionate lovers, but real partners, friends, accomplices. And even if sometimes the shadows of the past caught up with us, making us doubt and stumble, we stubbornly moved on, because we knew that our feelings had been tested by time and separation, that not everyone is given such a bright, all-consuming love, and that to lose it would be the biggest mistake in life. Epilogue. Many years have passed since then. Children have grown up. Life has changed its course many times. Helen and I are not young anymore. Our temples are touched with gray. But every time I look at her, I feel the same trembling in my chest, 
the same sweet languor that I felt at the very beginning, because for me she will forever remain the one, my soulmate, my other half, my only true love. We have gone through a lot together, difficulties and joys, losses and acquisitions, our eternal search for harmony. And I know that I would not trade a single day lived with her for anything in the world. Sometimes, on quiet evenings, we take out old photo albums, look at the yellowed pictures. Here we are, young, carefree, happy in our forbidden love. And here are the children, crumbs with surprised eyes, not yet knowing what tests lie ahead of them. Looking at these pictures, we smile wistfully, recalling that distant, magnificent, and terrible year that turned our lives upside down. The year when we both found and almost lost each other. The year when our love was really born. Love that managed to survive, to prevail over everything. And every time hugging my Helen, feeling the warmth of her body next to me, I thank fate for giving me this woman, for allowing me to know the whole palette of feelings. From the deepest despair to unearthly happiness. For teaching me to appreciate what I have, not to be afraid to fight for my love. Because our life is so short and fragile. And the only thing that remains after us is the warmth that we gave to each other, the memories that we keep in our hearts, and love, which is the only thing worth living for. Did you like this story? Let us know in the comments what you liked. Subscribe to our storytelling podcast. Also, don't forget to like and ring the bell so you don't miss more interesting stories. See you soon.